A few months ago, I was chatting to a guy that was quite high up at a major car manufacturer, and he mentioned something quite interesting. He said that some OEMs are looking at reducing the part count of their EVs by throwing out the traditional resistive cabin heater and instead using losses from the inverter to heat up the cabin, closer to how the system would work in a traditional combustion car. Now the problem with this is that inverters are incredibly efficient, so even high power ones don't produce enough loss to heat up the cabin most of the time. So he said they're actually looking at ways to increase the losses from the inverter on demand. So essentially your inverter not only has a throttle input, but it also has a temperature input. So this is what we're going to be looking at today. How can we make a power electronic converter less efficient when we want it to be, without affecting the efficiency when we don't, and also without having to add too much additional hardware? To make things a bit easier, I'm going to be using a buck converter instead of an inverter, as it was quicker and cheaper to make for this video, and it makes measuring the output power a lot easier. So let's have a think about what we have control over that we can potentially change to increase the losses in our MOSFETs, which is where we ideally want all of our additional loss to be, because that's where we're taking the heat from. Well, first off, we of course control our MOSFET from the gate. So what I've done is I've drawn the gate voltages for the high side and low side MOSFET. And we're going to take a look at them to have a think about what we could change. And the first thing we can potentially change is the amplitude. So that's the gate source voltage when we want the MOSFETs to be on. Typically this might be around 10 volts, but if we reduce it to say 5 volts, then we should get an increase in the on resistance of the MOSFET, which will give us more conduction loss. The problem with adjusting the amplitude is that it requires a variable supply voltage to the gate driver circuit, which typically you wouldn't have, so it would likely require some hardware changes. The next thing we could potentially change is the steepness of this slope, which is determined by the gate resistance, or RG. A stronger gate resistor, so that's a smaller value, will turn the MOSFET on and off faster, whereas a larger value will take a longer time to discharge the gate source capacitance. A gentle slope here represents more switching losses because we're spending more time between on and off. And in this middle state, the MOSFET has to dissipate quite a lot of power. Again, this may be a little more challenging to implement because the gate resistor is obviously a component. You can't just go in and change it. But some modern gate drivers do have a feature where they actually have two outputs. So you can have two separate gate resistors. And that means you can actually have the choice of three different gate resistances because the two of these are connected to the gate so you can either use just the first one, just the second one, or both, which would essentially just give you three different levels of switching loss that you can choose from. And then if you want finer control, you could almost do some kind of gate resistor modulation where, say the losses that you want are in between what you'd get from the weak resistor and the strong resistor, you switch between which output you're using at maybe a tenth of your switching frequency, something like that. But overall, varying the gate resistance definitely isn't the easiest option. So what else can we change? Well, we now know that every single transition between on and off for both MOSFETs has some loss associated with it, the switching energy. So for each MOSFET, we'll have the turn off loss and the turn on loss once per period. And if we were switching at say one kilohertz, then we would get that every one millisecond. But if we want more loss, why not switch faster? Then we get these switching losses more often, meaning that the overall switching loss in terms of power will be higher. And this is something that's really easy to change in the code that's running on the controller for the inverter, or in this case, buck converter. The final thing we're going to have a look at potentially fiddling with is what's called the dead time, which is a delay that is added between turning off one MOSFET and turning on the other MOSFET to make sure that they're not both on at the same time, which would result in something called shoot through, which is essentially short circuiting your power supply very briefly. In theory, if we can reduce this dead time very carefully, we can get a controlled amount of shoot through, which will give us quite significant losses. Of the four methods I've proposed, this is definitely the sketchiest, and for that reason I'm going to be saving it till the end. But I thought it would be interesting to at least take a look at. And as with varying the switching frequency, adjusting the dead time is very easy to do in software, and neither of them would require any hardware changes. So now that we have a plan for what we want to try changing, let's take a quick look at the hardware I've made for this experiment starting with this small 50 watt buck converter, which I've designed for a 50 volt input and a 5 volt 10 amp output. And because I designed it quite hastily a few weeks ago, it's only got a peak efficiency of 85%. But as we're looking at ways to change the efficiency and not peak efficiency, that doesn't really matter. In terms of control for this buck converter, it's all designed to be external, so these pins just have PWM inputs for the two gate drivers. Speaking of which, if we flip it over, you can see the gate drive circuitry, which is fairly conventional, except that I've implemented a variable voltage gate drive supply using a digital potentiometer and an adjustable linear regulator. So that means now the gate source voltage when the MOSFETs are on can be controlled in software. 
Now unfortunately with this board, we're not able to try the variable gate resistor concept, and that's because the modern gate drive ICs that allow you to have multiple gate resistors all have something called under voltage lockout, which means if we tried to turn down their supply voltage, they'd just turn off to protect the MOSFET. Whereas these much simpler gate drive chips that I'm using don't have that. And I thought that varying the gate drive supply voltage was the more interesting of the two options to take a look at. Now to calculate efficiency, we obviously need to measure the input power and the output power. And for that I've made these little plug and play power monitor modules. These make use of the really nice INA237 power monitor chip from Texas Instruments, which basically just needs a small shunt resistor to measure the current, it can measure the voltage directly, and internally it will calculate the power. Really useful. And as you can probably see, these boards just simply bolt straight onto my buck converter at the input and output. And finally for the controller I'm just using this dev board thing I made with a microchip ARM microcontroller. This experiment wouldn't have been possible without the low prices and rapid turnaround that JLC PCB can offer, the sponsor of today's video. They had absolutely no problems with producing the 4 layer 2 ounce board that I've used for the buck converter, or with the assembly of 5 of these power monitor modules. Both were at my door within a week of placing the order, which is very impressive. The quality of their in-house PCBA assembly is absolutely brilliant, and they have over 560,000 components in stock, so you won't be looking for long to find exactly what you need. Prices start with a setup fee as little as £8, with an additional per joint fee of just over a tenth of a penny. JLC PCB are also currently offering special discounts and gifts to celebrate Engineers Day, so make sure to check that out down below. So, if you're tired of soldering and you want your next project to arrive already assembled, check out the link in the video description to JLC PCB. So here's the full setup, we've got the buck converter here, with the MOSFETs on this big heatsink to make sure they don't overheat, even with all our extra losses. Then we've got a pair of the power monitor boards, one on the input and one on the output. I'm yet to acquire an electronic load, so I got this big 0.5 ohm resistor to draw the 10 amps at 5 volts that we want. And then all the jumper wires connect the three boards to my main controller, which not only uses the power measurements for the efficiency, but also the output voltage measurement for the regulation. And if we take a look at the display of my power supply, we can see it's actually on right now. 50 volts going in, a bit more than 1 amp, so that's about 55 watts, which we could use to calculate the efficiency. But why mess around doing that when we can just get the code to do it for us? Here you can see live readouts of power in, power out, losses, efficiency, and the output voltage, so we can make sure it's regulating properly. This is the beauty of those Texas Instruments power monitor chips, they're really nice. And having these live readouts obviously makes it very easy for us to see how much we've increased our losses by changing the various parameters we're going to be fiddling with. And as you can see, I'm currently running the converter at its best case efficiency of a bit over 85%. Right, so I've now spent a few hours testing this at various different operating conditions. Let's take a look at the results. Starting with the gate drive voltage, which as you can see, has quite an interesting effect on the efficiency. We're going to start off by ignoring this weird bit on the left, I'll come back to that later. You can see how, as expected, decreasing the gate drive voltage increases our losses because it's increasing the on resistance of the MOSFETs. And you can also see that the losses start to shoot up around 3.6 volts, which is where, as we can see in the datasheet, these MOSFETs will start to saturate at the current that we're running them at. And the saturation of the MOSFETs is the main reason that the efficiency drops off from about 73% to 56% within about 300 millivolts of gate drive. And I wasn't able to run with it any lower than this, because no matter how much I fiddled with the tuning of my PI controller, it just wasn't able to compensate for the saturation of the MOSFETs. I think if you were going to implement this in some kind of converter, you wouldn't want to run it this low, this close to the threshold, because MOSFET to MOSFET variance of threshold might mean that one MOSFET in your inverter is operating as you'd like with a high RDS on, while another MOSFET driven at the same voltage might be saturating. But we are still able to get a decent bump in losses from this, going from about 9 watts at optimal gate drive voltage, up to maybe 15 watts, still at a safe-ish gate drive voltage. And now let's take a look at what on earth is going on over here. And what's happening is entirely down to my choice of gate driver. The chips I've chosen have a single supply, which is the one we're controlling, and the digital input to the gate drive that tells it when to turn the MOSFET on and off is required to exceed a certain voltage threshold for the gate driver to turn the MOSFET on. And this threshold is determined by the supply voltage to the gate driver. So that means if we make the supply voltage too high, the 3.3 volt digital input will never actually exceed that threshold, so it will never turn the MOSFET on but then surely the converter wouldn't work at all. Well, that's only the case for the low side MOSFET. The high side MOSFET, because it's run in a bootstrap configuration, is driven through a digital isolator with a 5 volt output. 
So essentially what's happening here is that our low side MOSFET's never turning on, and we're just relying on its body diode for conduction, which is actually quite a useful thing to do. We've reduced our efficiency, which is the goal, and we've done it in a really nice reliable way. The only problem is that in inverters, current flows through the half bridge in both directions, so commutation of the diode isn't as reliable. And also just using the body diode as an attraction inverter means you're not able to employ regenerative braking below base speed. Anyway, that's starting to get a bit too motory for this video. So the next thing we can try is increasing the switching frequency, which gives a very pretty plot. We can see that there's an optimal point where our efficiency is highest. Reducing or increasing the switching frequency from there brings down our efficiency and increases our losses. The effects that cause these increases in losses are quite different, and we'll start by looking at the simpler one, which is at higher frequencies. And I'm happy to see that this line is almost perfectly straight, because that backs up the theory. Just like I said before, the more frequently we switch, the more times we will be dissipating the switching energy, so it makes sense that it's perfectly linear. And compared to the gate drive voltage, this is a much nicer and more effective way to increase our losses. We're starting off with an optimal loss of about 10 watts, and we can quite easily take it past 20 watts, so more than double. And because of this lovely continuous gradient, it means implementing a controller for this would be very simple. And unlike the gate drive voltage, there's no risk of a small amount of error in the controller resulting in massive increase in loss. Moving over to the low frequency side, the reason our losses increase here is because the slower we switch, the greater the current ripple is going to be in our inductor. So if we're switching at say 50 kilohertz, the current's just gonna be going up and down like this quite quickly and not varying too much. Maybe say for our 10 amp output, it's going from 11 amps to nine amps. But if we switch as slow as five kilohertz, our inductor current might be going up to 30 amps and then down to minus 10 amps. Yes, it can go negative. And that means we have much higher losses in our inductor and our capacitors because they're having to deal with this ripple current and our MOSFETs with more conduction loss because of the higher current. And we've even got more switching loss because the current at the switching transitions is much higher. So you might be thinking, oh, this is great. Reducing the switching frequency gives us really big losses. But the problem is the losses aren't just in the MOSFETs, which is where we want it. The losses in the capacitors are particularly critical because they'll get really hot. They might even overheat and explode. So of the two directions that we can change the switching frequency, increasing is definitely the preferred option. And the third and final parameter we're going to take a look at is dead time, which I must admit had a disappointingly minimal effect on efficiency. You can see that like with switching frequency, there is an optimal dead time at which we have best efficiency. If we reduce our dead time, we get a little bit of extra loss, which is probably a small amount of shoot through. But even with zero dead time, which doesn't show up on this logarithmic axis, the loss didn't go up any higher than this. And the reason the loss increases on the other side is actually because of something we've already encountered, and that's that with a very long dead time, the body diode is conducting for a significant proportion of the duty cycle. In fact, at the maximum dead time over here, the low side MOSFET never turns on, which essentially makes this the same as what we had earlier, except the efficiency is slightly lower here because I did the test of dead time at a higher switching frequency so that the effect would be more pronounced. So my conclusion for adjusting dead time is don't, it doesn't really achieve anything, and it's really not worth the risk of major shoot through if that was to happen. Well that was all quite interesting wasn't it? I did spend quite a while trying to run high switching frequency and low gate drive supply voltage, but my simple PI controller was really struggling to keep a stable output voltage, and I'm not an expert in control I'm afraid. And on that terrible disappointment it's time to end. Thank you very much for watching, and good night.